Thank you, everybody, for coming in this evening. Great turnout uh, for what I know is going to be a fantastic lecture. It's, it's a real... Thank you. Now we have your attention. Um, no, it's a, it's a real pleasure to welcome Stan Allen back, back here at the AA. A uh, frequent visitor uh, over many years and a friend um, for many years also, um, who is here on tonight's occasion is, uh, is a, a lecture presented alongside the launch of a new book titled Landform Building, uh, which Stan, of course, is going to be talking about this evening. And I was, I was just telling Stan that I was doing the math as we were walking down downstairs that it was 15 years ago. Um, uh, that I had the chance to invite Stan in during year one of an experiment we were undertaking for the creation of a new graduate design studio here, which we, that autumn, 15 years ago, decided to name the DRL. And it's still something we look at as the kind of beta year. This was before we sort of worked out what we wanted to do. And Stan's, the, the chance to invite Stan in wasn't, of course, in any way accidental. <coughs> it's, it's already by that time, I think Stan was at the forefront of a generation that came of age in the 90s, as did certain computational and other technologies um, that provided the means by which to really rethink a great number of assumptions and ideas about what guides and shapes what we call contemporary architectural culture. By the mid-90s, Stan is absolutely at the forefront of that generational project, uh, and one that I think you all will know well through the writings that he had already by that time undertaken around topics like the diagram built form and soon after the topic of landscape and what he was writing of as a kind of field space sensibility that of course relates in, in quite direct ways to the arrival of certain technologies, particularly digital technologies through which space itself was being rethought. Tonight's book, uh, Landform, which Stan's going to be presenting and talking about, uh, examines the relationship indeed of the, of landscape, built form and landscape urbanism in um, new and I think quite provocative ways. Um, and the book is a remarkable, I think, next step in a generational project to rethink very fixed formal terms by which we think we understand both the built environment and architectural space uh, more generally. And in fact, I think one of the crucial subtexts to the book, including its title, uh, is the questioning of landscape in relation not just to urbanism, but of course to the built form or the architectural object itself. And I'll say no more on that front because that's what Stan will be setting out for us, I think, uh, in the coming uh, hour. And Stan is an architect working in New York and the dean of the School of Architecture at Princeton University. Uh, he holds degrees from Brown, the Cooper Union, and Princeton University. Um, he has taught at Harvard, Columbia, and <coughs> uh, Princeton, and his architectural firm, SAA, Stan Allen Architect. Uh, has realized buildings and urban projects in the United States, South America, and Asia. In 2008, he received a PA award for the Taichung Gateway Park uh, and a Faith and Form Award for the CCV Chapel, recent projects finished by the office. Um, and more recently, in 2010, his building for Paju Book City in Korea uh, received an AIA award. He is the author of numerous articles and publications on ar architecture, uh, points, and lines, diagrams, and projects for the city, I think is a book that many here will know and know well in his essays, Practice, Architecture, Technique, and Representation uh, in 2008 is the background through which this most recent work has been developed. Uh, the Landform uh, publication comes out of a conference that Stan arranged as Dean of Princeton uh, two years ago in 2009 and is a compilation of the discussion and projects that came out of that. And please join me in welcoming Stan Allen. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, it, it's, it's, it's not accidental that this book has the word form and the word building in the title. So uh, uh, in addition to land, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, and also that, that Brett and I do share a long history. In fact, there was a, uh, an anniversary event uh, for the Architectural League Emerging Voices. And Brett and I were kids together in that program in 1986, I believe it was. Uh, uh, now, the other thing, uh, uh, and it seems to be getting a little warm, so I'm just going to take the jacket off, um, is that one of the things I like about the AA and, and, and what Brett has done is that you tend to get invited back for lectures. And I, I actually checked 
and I lectured here in uh, January of 2009, uh, shortly before the land, Landform Building Conference was, was organized. Um, and and uh, it's, it's, on the one hand, I think this is great. I mean, Brett doesn't just check off that box and say he's had that person, but he keeps inviting people back. Now, of course, as a lecturer, that, that, that raises the bar. You can't just pull out your old lecture and, uh, and, and regurgitate what you've been saying of other places. Um, on the other hand, schools renew themselves. So uh, what I want to do here is to start with a kind of snapshot of the important buildings and projects over the past uh, two to three years. Uh, then I will talk in detail about the Landform book and the Landform ideas. And then I want to end with two projects that uh, show a little bit where our thinking is uh, in, in, in the present. So, so this is a project that I think I probably did show two and a half years ago when I lectured here. Uh, and it's a modest project. It's a single family house on Long Island, um, finished in 2008. Um, one of a number of projects by invited architects for uh, uh, a kind of prototypical lots in, in eastern Long Island. Um, but I think what's important here is uh, this was the first project, because we were working on landscape projects simultaneously. Uh, and where we really thought consciously about the figure of the building on the landscape, and in particular, the sort of profile as it, as it uh, meets the sky. Even in these very early drawings, uh, that, that active roof profile was very, very important. It's a very small lot. In consequence, the idea that the house could be expansive vertically as opposed to horizontally, it's definitively not a field conditions project. It, it works with the verticality uh, of architecture. Uh, if it comes straight down to the ground on the front, here on the back, it's kind of lifted up almost in a, a kind, of, kind of reference to a, a sort of piloti uh, condition. Uh, that sense of a kind of active profile continued uh, with a, another project which is uh, currently unbuilt, but we hope will at some point start up for a house on the, on the seaside in the Philippines. Um, uh, house where we create a kind of artificial landscape at a lower level, but then at this upper level, again, it's very much about the, the, the kind of iconicity of the house and the profile on the landscape. This was a project which had more to do with working with an, with an existing urban context. Um, interesting story, we were first commissioned to do this project in, in around 2000, 2001 got put on hold for about six or eight years. And when we came back in 2007, there were 150 buildings built on site. Uh, that actually turned out to be a kind of advantage for us. Um, we had one of these so-called boulevard sites here. And the typology is, is called a bookshelf typology. Uh, this, this just details our response to those uh, uh, zoning codes. But certainly, our concern as we came back to work into this context, um, this is in, in uh, north of Seoul, Korea, was to uh, create a, a kind of simpler building that would work on, uh, with the surfaces. And uh, the primary activation would be uh, the exposed circulation around the outside of the building. So you can see it's a very simple uh, rectilinear footprint. But one of the things very important to us is to pull people from both the back and the front to the center of the building. So all those different pathways come together. Um, and then you see we push the interior circulation to the sides. Uh, and that sort of peels up uh, and, and kind of activates what, what is, in fact, a very, very simple form. And then we articulate the surface itself, the envelope itself, um, through a series of sliding panels. We developed a number of different uh, color schemes. Uh, but the analogy here that actually came from the client is these were like the spines of books on the bookshelves. Uh, so again, with this very simple, uh, relatively inexpensive curtain wall gets activated by that series of sliding uh, panels. Um, this was an interesting project. This was a pro bono project that we did for a, a site in the Philippines. Um, it's a kind of campus that takes care of um, orphaned and, in some cases, handicapped uh, children. Um, and the chapel uh, is a, a 
they told us they had a very low budget. Um, they couldn't pay us a fee, but they would basically build anything we drew. And as architects, you can never resist that. Um, so behind the kids is the campus itself, and the chapel also forms a kind of gateway. So you can see that, the access road of the chapel, the bell tower, which was never built, the gate to the, to the, the, the campus here. Um, but there were a number of important considerations here. Again, it had to be built uh, inexpensively with the available technologies there. Um, it had to be very, very open to um, the, the community. Um, it's, uh, for us, is a very interesting building because it's really more of a pavilion than a building. There's no uh, mechanical systems. There's no glass in the windows. And uh, the exterior paving uh, flows right in through these large pivoting doors so that, that there's really a kind of continuity between the inside and the outside. When it rains, the rain comes in through these slots, and the paving is an exterior paving, and they just sweep the water out. So it, it has this rather kind of elemental quality, which is emphasized by the, the idea of just tracing a single line and looping around the baptistry and um, the, the priest's uh, quarters here. Uh, and then that line is canted uh, for structural reasons, high seismic zone, um, and uh, the, uh, this acacia tree that had to be preserved. So you can see the way that this, this very simple structure, again, with a kind of active roof profile, which is in this case partly a product of the profile itself and partly a product of the geometries, but then calibrating the light as it moves in uh, through all these series of openings to really make the pavilion porous to, to give a sense of enclosure and focus, which is necessary for the ritual itself, but also to have a sense of porosity uh, to the landscape ar around it. Uh, now, when these, well, these smaller projects are happening, we're also working uh, on large scale projects that could be called landscape urbanism projects. And I'm just going to show one of these here, uh, which is the Taichung Gateway Park. City of Taichung, which is uh, about an hour south of Taipei by the high-speed railway. Um, historic center of the city is located here. And the city had expanded. And the former municipal airport uh, was relocated further out, leaving this vast empty site, 240 hectares, about as close to a tabula rasa as you can possibly get, less than a meter of height change across the length of the, uh, of the site. But of course, the site was completely disconnected from, uh, from, from the city. So our uh, proposition here also was to work strategically. What can the city control? The city can control roadways and open space. But the city itself is going to grow up to the void that we carve out here uh, in the city. And if we're successful, the old boundary of the airport will disappear and the new figure of the park will emerge over time. It's also, there's a level of uncertainty. We don't know how this project is going to develop uh, in, in, in the future. This is the image of the built up uh, park uh, as envisioned uh, at the end of the process. Uh, the large kind of gateway buildings to the north end of the site where the park is lifted up over the buildings as well as flowing under. The programming of the park itself into into separate zones while it's still kind of unified by these uh, geometries, the, the continuous presence of the park landscape itself, but then the recognition that we won't have strict control over the neighborhoods around, uh, us, around the, the, the park itself. The exception to that are the kind of large gateway buildings at the north end of the site, which include a convention center, transportation hub, and a small uh, stadium. And those would be seen on the ring road, the towers moving in parallax uh, to create this kind of dynamic sense of a gateway for the project. Now, this project was finished actually probably right around 2009. Um, it's uh, been accepted as the planning framework for the city. And basically, this part of the city, the, the infrastructural construction has started. The city is going to pretty much follow this pattern. But it's going to be a long process. It could be 10 or 15 years, even 20 years, uh, before it's finally built out. 
So we convinced the, the mayor, the clients, that they really ought to do something to bring people on site in the interim. And um, they appropriated money for a temporary pavilion to, to be up for two years. And we did a series of studies working on the assumption that that would be a freestanding pavilion. They didn't appropriate that much money. Uh, and it was one of those instances where the budget constraint really worked in our favor. Because we had no money for a freestanding building, uh, we, we looked at what was available on site. And one of these hangars that had been built in the 1950s uh, to do maintenance on the aircraft in the airport was available. Fabulous structure. Of course, it has a very heavy concrete slab, so you don't need a foundation. It has a roof, so you don't have to worry about keeping the rain out. So not only were we able to solve the pragmatic problems of building inexpensively and quickly for the temporary building, we were also, we were also uh, keying back to the history of the, of the airport. And of course, the idea that whatever we would build would set up some kind of dialogue with uh, the, the, the big industrial space of the hangar was very, very exciting to us. So uh, this is the building that we, we built. Uh, it was inaugurated um, a little over a year ago. Um, and it will be up for about another 18 months. Uh, and the program is to bring people onto the site uh, to exhibit all of the plans and animations and models of the project, uh, and then also to bring people up to an overlook platform where they'll, they'll be able to watch the pro process of uh, construction. Now, uh, again, working from the pragmatics of having to build quickly on site, w the first thing we thought about was the tradition in Asia of using bamboo scaffolding. Uh, it's quick, it's local, it's recyclable at the end of the project, um, and it seemed like a, a, a really uh, powerful solution to this problem. Uh, interesting story, two interesting stories. Uh, we presented to our clients in Taiwan, and they said, oh, that's very nice, but in Taiwan, we're modern. We use metal scaffolding. Um, we were able to convince them in the end, uh, but we also ran across the problem, which is that the occupancy codes would not allow us to create public occupancy supported only by bamboo. Bamboo is very strong. It certainly would have held up, but uh, sometimes the codes get in the way. So in reality, there is a steel frame that supports this second level. Um, it's actually useful. You, you enter below. You come up a stairway. This is the main exhibition space. And then this is the auditorium slash stairs that bring you up to the, uh, to the overlook. And uh, you can see here that there's up to three meters of bamboo scaffolding and then the bamboo skin wrapping the whole project from the outside to give it a kind of uh, a dynamism which, which has to do with the movement and flow. Uh, here you see that this is, this is where you, you come in, the reception, multimedia on the ground floor. Uh, we just got these photographs by uh, Iwan Bon, and of course his photographs always activate the space with, uh, with people, and you get that sense of the kind of dynamism of the, this strange object in this industrial space and then the movement of people around and through. This is that lower level space, the stairway moving up, um, the, the way we handled things like lighting and ceilings with a kind of fabric structure. Really, it was very important in the, for, for us in this project to, to make it very clear that this is a temporary building, not to try and appeal to permanence and solidity, but to make it light and really make the temporary quality uh, thematic. So even here in these little details where you peek through and you see the density of the scaffolding and then the main exhibition area, the bleachers that lead up to the overlook. Uh, here you see the school groups seated there. Uh, the views out from the platform to the hangar, the renovated hangar, the way the, the, the pavilion sort of dissolves into the structure of the roof above. and. Um, you know, it's a big object, but I think it still has a certain intimacy, uh, as you can see in that particular uh, photograph. And then um, some other event going on here. This guy was certainly having a, a good time. There's a, there's a slight coda to this. We were uh, actually just uh, opened in September, uh, asked to do something for the Chengdu Biennial. 
And um, the thing about biennial exhibitions is nothing ever happens in them. And um, so our proposal uh, was uh, we would make a s small bamboo pavilion again, but at least it would be inhabited by birds so that there was somebody activating and uh, uh, living in the, 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 the structure. This is something that always bothers me about these, these biennial pavilions. So, so we built a small uh, aviary for, for Chengdu. That opened a couple of months ago. All right. So the, the, basically, this is by way of setting up the landform uh, building book. Um, in some ways, as uh, a, a means to triangulate between these different scales and different involvement in, in our work. That we're, we're working in a large scale with the extended field of the city and landscape. At the same time, we're working with very specific, very bounded, very compact uh, buildings. So there was a kind of intuition at the time that we could think about not the, the claim of landscape urbanism, which was for cross-disciplinary work, but the claim for the effects of landscape as they operated within specific bounded compact uh, buildings themselves. So as Brett says, uh, said, the, the conference took place in 2009. And then uh, the, the book really took on a life of its own um, as a kind of project. To, to look back to uh, the, the beginning and the middle of the 1990s and the kind of uh, uh, fascination that, land, that architects had for landscape at that time, which obviously coincided with the emergence of curvilinearity, the, the early digital tools which made this kind of construction possible. It was around this time that Winnie Moss said that uh, uh, architects use the word landscape as often as Americans use the word fuck. Um, and uh, you, you know, architects fell in love with landscape in the 90s. And they fell in love with landscape for some very, very specific reasons. Now, if we look at some more recent work, this is Toyo Ito. Uh, you're not, this is a crematorium. We're not supposed to walk on that roof, but uh, you know, it, it, it begs to be walked on and the very clear rhyme between the hills and the roof itself, or more mainstream projects, Renzo Piano, uh, of course, Peter Eisenman's project in Santiago, uh, Ahmed's uh, Mountain of Flowers. Um, all of this, it was, it was also like taking the kind of temperature of a lot of work that was working in this, this particular uh, territory. But if you go back to that moment of the 1990s, and, and the attraction um, of landscape for architects, I think it has less to do with the immediate formal relationships than it does with notions about the diagram and the way in which landscapes perform over time. These are, these are geological simulations done by a, a scientist called Taylor Perron up at MIT, where there are uh, computer algorithms written to simulate a uh, process of um, of uh, erosion and resistance over time. And of course, if we think about that period of the middle uh, uh, 19, 1990s, the, the proposition of a building like uh, Yokohama, Yokohama is nothing if not, a, not an artificial landscape. Um, the, the, the building was finished later, but it was designed in the, in the middle uh, 1990s. Um, and uh, works from around that uh, same period by, by MVRDV, uh, the notion of Villa VPRO that uh, within the, the deep uh, uh, footprint of this building, there are landscape-like conditions that will allow the uh, users to sort of evolve an office landscape uh, over time. So we think about the, the attractions that landscape held for architects around that time. Of course, on one level, it had to do with the always constant dialogue between the artificial and the natural, which goes back to the 19th century and the origins of landscape architecture as a field. Uh, this is the construction of Central Park. We tend to think of Central Park as a, as a pastoral landscape, but it's actually a piece of engineering. It's a highly engineered, constructed artificial landscape, as you can see by the tree moving machine that. Um, that Olmsted developed for Prospect Park. Um, 
And uh, more recent histories, Jean Renaudi in, in Paris, a kind of vertical landscape for this uh, housing. Uh, Diller Scofidio's Blur building, creating this kind of sense of kind of, kind of atmosphere inhabiting uh, a natural phenomenon uh, that clearly uh, the, 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 the blurring of the boundary and playing with the problem of the artificial natural is one of these issues that's at stake in the, the intersection between landscape and uh, architecture. Also, again, with the assistance of digital tools, um, the attention to surface, to surface as a kind of active component in uh, architecture. Um, and uh, somebody like Jim Corner, uh, this, his collaborator and friend Alex McLean, uh, is one of his aerial photographs, uh, says, you know, when you look at, our, look at landscape, you have to think like a farmer. You, you have to think about the contours of the land and the way you would plow, what's wet, what's, um, what's dry, uh, what gets sun, what doesn't get sun. So I, I think there, there, if there was a parallel, formal parallel between the early digital work, which was concerned with surface, and the landscape work, also one of the important lessons from landscape was the performative quality of those surface landscapes. So, in, in some of the early work that Jim Corner and I did together for Downsview Park, um, we, we th were thinking very, very consciously about uh, working those surfaces in a way that would, would actually activate that landscape uh, over time. And then the parallel work on the part of architects working at the very large scale. This is Riser Umamoto's um, uh, West Side project. Again, a project of about 98, 99. Um, where you have a kind of massive uh, piece of urban infrastructure that's treated uh, like a kind, of, a kind of landscape surface. And then, of course, uh, as a kind of built phenomenon, uh, that happened in, in a kind of uh, miniature form uh, at the High Line uh, in, in New York, again, working with um, a, a disused piece of infrastructure and reclaiming it through some of those same uh, landscape strategies. Now, there's another very attractive thing about um, landscape, which is that, that, that landscape is the horizontal ground on which indeterminate program can play itself uh, out. This notion that sort of anything can happen on the green uh, uh, landscape uh, surface. Um, this also can be a bit of a trap as well. And I think this is part of the discussion and critique around questions of program. This is Weissman Frady's Olympic Sculpture Park. And then when you think about also, especially if you think through the infrastructural analogy, uh, the way in which the, the pathways and the nodes of information exchange are replicated in, in the infrastructural surfaces that allow for the distributed landscape of the American city and the American uh, countryside. Um, I would claim that to date, this is the definitive built piece of landscape urbanism. Uh, this is Weissman Frady's Olympic Sculpture Park in uh, Seattle. Um, they took, uh, and, and I, I think one of the reasons that makes this such a compelling project is the way it works so closely with all of the existing infrastructures. There's rail lines, there's highways, um, and uh, the project also uh, makes possible uh, connections both in this direction, but also down to the waterfront that hadn't been uh, made possible uh, before that. So on the one hand, a project like this, I think also probably Yokohama, create a kind of dilemma. Uh, they're, they're definitive works, but they also say, well, where do you go from here? Uh, can you do more with landscape urbanism that hasn't sort of already been done in those two uh, definitive projects. Um, and their, their weddedness to strategies of horizontal connectivity that also belong to, to landscape. So part of the rethinking around the landform was to come back to the iconic vertical uh, capacity of architecture uh, to resituate that historically as part of the, 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 the discipline's memory 
uh, Bruegel's uh, Tower of Babel as a kind of clear point of reference. But one of the things we did was just simply to connect, collect um, images from Mexico and Switzerland, um, Malaparte's uh, uh, villa uh, in, in, in Capri, designed by Libera, although Malaparte is said to have a, a hand in it. There's a great story about this project, um, strange story. Uh, Malaparte was visited by none other than, than Erwin Rommel and, uh, after the Battle of El Alamein. And he asked Malaparte, did you, did you buy the house ready-made or did you design it? And Malaparte's answer was, the house was ready-made, I designed the landscape. Um, it's not true, of course, but it's actually the best sense of the way this house actually works uh, relative uh, to its landscape. Uh, and popular culture, I mean, this is, this is Walt Disney. Um, again, to kind of construct a new genealogy, Gottfried Baum, uh, of projects that uh, could inform our present day uh, thinking. Um, and these are the four categories around which the book is organized. Form, scale, process, and uh, atmosphere. Um, the imitation of uh, natural form, the shift in scale uh, from landscape to architecture, uh, the question of process, and um, the notion of atmosphere, that, that uh, it's not always about the object. It's also that, that one of the characteristics of landscape is that it's a it's, it's an immersive uh, environment. Now, if, if, if each of these categories has a further subtitle, uh, the notion of the artificial mountain. And here is where another important part of the argument uh, comes through, which is to say there's an argument here coinciding with this work of the 90s and the emergence of digital technology. I think it's safe to say that the dominant metaphor in architecture from the early 1990s until the present has been biological. In other words, an effort to make architecture more lifelike, more adaptive. Uh, you, you, you see this operating at two different levels. On the one hand, the arguments of somebody like Greg Lynn working through um, uh, based on uh, the, the insights of somebody like, like Darcy Thompson, using digital technologies uh, not so much to imitate the forms of nature, but to imitate the process of form making within nature. And hence to produce an architecture, I mean, uh, Greg's book after all is called Animate Form, that has some of the, the liveliness uh, and adaptability of, of uh, natural, natural form. At the urban scale, I think the analogy has been more to the processes of evolution and uh, eco uh, ecological change over time. But again, a similar claim to make architecture more adaptive and lifelike and closer to the biological. Now, um, I would propose in, 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 in this particular chapter a bit of a shift and to say that um, architecture is always located between the biological and the geological. The slowness and the resistance of the geological and also even, uh, let's say, the formal languages of the geological it seems to me, uh, it, at least within the, the limited category of landform building, offers a, perhaps a more productive way uh, forward. And that was also a way of getting out of, uh, if, if you will, the kind of default form of the landform building as the sort of gently rounded mound. I mean, how many buildings like this have we seen, you know? Um, uh, that, that notion that there's a kind of automatic continuity with nature through the sort of softly, softly rounded uh, mound. Uh, hence, to call buildings like uh, Moneo's course hall, uh, clearly in this photograph, uh, Moneo himself talks about the building as, as rocks scattered on the beach. Uh, this is Mancio and Tunion's uh, Museum of Immigration in Algeciras, um, based on a very similar project in Cantabria. Um, 
building as a kind of artificial mountain, as a kind of crystalline geological form. And very beautiful built project by Giancarlo Manzanti, uh, this library in uh, Medellin, which he very explicitly in his project description talks about as a kind of geological uh, formation. Uh, that within the harsh social landscape of Medellin, something hard and resistant, a kind of rearranging of the geography was required. Now, each of these sections has uh, curated work by an artist, um, uh, Tacita Dean, whose uh, fabulous piece just opened at the, at the Tate, um, provided us with this very interesting s series of uh, found photographs uh, set very consciously as uh, somebody who thinks in sequence into a sequence uh, found object or found <coughs> photographs and postcards of ice formations again ways of putting form together uh, that, that 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 are uh, disorganized and chaotic and and formless in a, in a certain way um, that are, are 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 pushing back against some of the formal expectations now, obviously, one of the big differences between landscape and, and architecture is that landscapes are bigger than uh, buildings. And how can uh, architecture leverage that scale, especially in the landscape? And uh, we borrowed this term from Kenneth Frampton, who uh, talked to us about the megaform as urban landscape. Um, uh, Kenneth, I don't think, would endorse this image, but... Um, this, this perhaps uh, 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 more so. Uh, but the notion of the building working at the top, topographical scale in, in the landscape, uh, megaform as a kind of conscious uh, response to the megastructure. Uh, I've always been fascinated by this image, Hans Holein's aircraft carrier in the landscape. But if this icon from the 1960s, I would say, here, technology is very clearly pitted against the landscape. I think today we can start thinking about large-scale interventions in the landscape that are working in a way uh, all, without ever pretending to imitate lands, landform directly, but they're working uh, in a more sympathetic relationship to the landscape. This is OMA's uh, project in the Middle East. Certainly, Stephen Hall's Banke Center um, this large horizontal uh, structure lifted up. Uh, I don't know if I have the, uh, I don't have the diagram. It's, it's as long as the Chrysler building is tall. And by lifting it up, they create this kind of artificial horizontal landscape uh, somewhere, again, between architecture and landscape. Dominique Perrault's uh, Women's College in Seoul as a kind of negative landform. A uh, project of ours uh, for an invited competition where we created a continuous structure running the length of this park and then developed different portions of that above and below as uh, built uh, landscapes uh, that in some cases are sort of dissolving into the natural uh, landscape. Um, the project for this section um, are a series of collages done by a very interesting uh, Japanese artist from the 1970s, um, working with photo collage to, to, to really um, put nature and, and the city into kind of, kind of stark uh, uh, juxtaposition uh, here. Um, again, if you want more, you have to buy the book. They're fabulous <laughs> images. Um, the, this, this was a very important category for us, uh, again, to get away from the notion of the building always as an object on the landscape and to recognize that in the contemporary city, so many of the spaces of the city are these large, immersive interior landscapes, that there's a category of building, there's a category of interior in which the interior is so large that the interior becomes an exterior to other interiors within uh, the building. Uh, Villanova uh, Artigas' uh, Architecture Faculty of Sao Paulo, uh, of course, uh, significantly this photograph taken during one of the student, student protests, where you can see the way in which the, 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 the building 
itself, because of its scale and its infrastructure, structural condition, becomes like a kind of outdoor public space or uh, landscape. Uh, the atria of, uh, of Portman, for, for, for example. Uh, the idea that our cities are becoming more landscape-like, not because they're greener, but because more and more they're, they're made of these interconnected, vast interior uh, spaces. And the way in which architects are coming to terms with this new sense of kind of atmospheric, immersive, the immersive space of landscape constructed as an interior. Uh, this is Sana's unbuilt project uh, in Valencia. Um, and uh, Junji Ishigami's uh, brilliant uh, uh, library in uh, the Kate Institute of Technology. Um, the interior as a kind of forest, immersive forest-like uh, space. Um, and I think you can see that in Philippe Brahm's um, biennial uh, installation from a, a number of years ago. Uh, and in Nishizawa's um, museum um, uh, for uh, the Japanese artist Rei Naito. Uh, these are her works, actually, uh, here. And a building, again, which is kind of continuous with nature, creating this, uh, with the geometry, in this case, a kind of atmospheric space that has this sense of kind of boundlessness within a, a, a fairly tight, bounded uh, space. And here, we, we were uh, very happy to be able to, to, to publish a series of these very beautiful photographs by the um, Swiss-Italian photographer, uh, Walter uh, Niedermayer. Um, Niedermayer photographs landscape in ways that has never been photographed before. It, it, it's, it's the, you're, you're in, he makes landscape into the, a very vertical, very planar kind of condition. There's always the presence of man in these landscapes. They become uh, they become very layered and compact. Uh, again, a sense of kind of immersion. Um, uh, really quite extraordinary uh, uh, photographs. If you get a chance to see these in person, you, you, you definitely should. And then finally, it, it became very important for us to think about how you actually build a landscape. Um, it's not so difficult to pile up dirt in the landscape. But to construct these forms can, can actually be uh, quite, quite difficult. And then, of course, there are the allusions to quarries and so on. Um, the two projects I'm showing here, this is by uh, Nader Tarani and, and Monica Ponce de Leon, Office Da, um, for a building which, again, this building could have been in the megaform section. But I was particularly interested in the way in which uh, this interior space and the coffering of, the, of the, the large artificial landscape of this project was uh, treated. Uh, Nader in the conference was also very, very sort of immediate and direct. He said, well, the ground is a very stubborn thing. Uh, it wants to be flat if it's going to be occupiable. Um, so in, in a sense, the landscape here becomes the roof. And this roof is what allows them to move smoothly between different programs, from a very large stadium to outdoor sports and things to cinemas, and then there's housing above. And the coffering system goes through a very subtle series of transformations to create that, that sort of smooth set of transitions, uh, again, to create the kind of landscape-like condition of, of the roof, but again, done through very, very precise design operations at the level of uh, detail. Um, we uh, published two pieces by um, uh, Fabian Schurer of um, Design to Production, um, the, who did all the computation for the form work for SANA's uh, EPFL, uh, their, their recently completed building in Lausanne. And we also uh, have a piece by the engineers. So in other words, to this building, which again is nothing if not a constructed landscape, um, we wanted to look at that process of construction itself in, 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 in some detail to publish the project in ways that has never been published before, uh, showing the process of construction itself, uh, the extraordinary quantities of rebar. Um, again, some very interesting, the, the fact that there, uh, there are, in fact, ribs in this uh, structure, um, and very interesting um, questions about uh, what kind of 
very in intense technical discussion about how this project is actually uh, realized. And a, a friend of mine who runs a program called Land Arts of the American West, uh, and they did a digital scan of Michael Heiser's uh, double negative, um, ending with, with Rainer Banham um, in his, I don't think he rode his bicycle all the way to Death Valley. Um, uh, but again, with these sort of prototypical landscapes, the, the immersive horizontal landscape of the desert and then the, the iconic silhouette of the mountains uh, themselves. All right, so that's the middle piece of the book, a uh, uh, middle piece of the lecture around the book, uh, Landform Building. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to close with two projects that I'm going to show in, in a little bit greater detail that could, on the one hand, be understood as coming out of the landform building work, uh, specifically this category of geological form, crystalline form. But it, they also connect back to some much earlier work that, uh, that I did, actually in that period of the middle 1990s that, uh, that Brett was talking about. Um, the, the pieces that I published around the notion of uh, field conditions, this is the Swedish translation, f f uh, fields uh, from object to field, um, and a project from that period, from, from the middle uh, 1990s. So there's a trajectory here where the field conditions work led to landscape and landscape fields, and then coming back through landform building to return to some of the ideas of the field conditions work uh, but now um, with a different, different set, of, uh, set of concerns. So just some of, the, some of the images and diagrams from that uh, earlier work. Of course, Le Corusier's Venice Hospital was a very important point of reference. Still very much a kind of horizontal, uh, kind of mat building condition. Uh, Melnikov's Sukharov Market. You see the way the repetition of this individual unit again, be begins to create a, a variation out of the repetition of similar or fairly similar parts repeated uh, that, that create a potential difference over the course of the whole. Also the diagram work. I mean, for me, one of the things that diagrams are about is about provisionality, openness, and immediacy. And I can't think of a better example than this uh, Tony Craig piece. Um, I love the t uh, designation no longer extant. I have a feeling that about Two seconds after the photograph was taken, the piece was no longer extant. Uh, but a as there is in a lot of Tony Craig's work, I, I, I think that sense of provisionality and immediacy that also in turn allows us an openness on the part of either the viewer or the user is something that's quite important to me. So two competition projects. Um, our criteria for doing competitions is is, is the site and the program interesting enough that, that it will kind of push the ideas in the studio forward? Uh, we, we won a few. We didn't win in or any of these two. Uh, but they're definitely sort of pushing the ideas uh, forward. This was a competition for a contemporary art gallery uh, for Maribor in Slovenia. Uh, Maribor, quite intact historical town. This was the site along the Drava River. Um, and uh, immediately outside of the historical wall of the city, but in a portion of the city that was still relatively intact, um, had this very uh, uh, typical both uh, f fabric of the city, but also these um, rather characteristic um, uh, pitched tile roofs. Now, we, we felt there was a kind of contradiction in the, in the competition brief. That is to say, they wanted a very identifiable, singular, new institution progressive, forward-looking institution that, that would um, house contemporary art. At the same time, there was a need to kind of stitch it back into this uh, historic context. We felt that could be accomplished not so much by any kind of, kind of uh, iconic references, uh, but rather by, by thinking about the kind of structure of the, the, the city itself. Now, one of the things that gives historic cities their, their character is the kind of rhythm of blocks and uh, uh, the, the, the accumulation of, of buildings uh, over time. So this idea that, that 
harked back to the field conditions work of working with increments that were then aggregated into larger holes became a way to work with that relationship to uh, uh, the traditional city without in any way literally imitating uh, the forms. It was also a programmatic response. Uh, there were a series of very open, very public programs uh, that could be accommodated, let's say, in continuity with the city. And then uh, the exhibition galleries themselves do require a certain amount of modularity and rhythm and definition of individual uh, spaces. Um, this is a diagram. Uh, uh, it's a, uh, about uh, definition of species, um, and uh, it's a fairly contemporary biologist. This is the Linnaean model, where you have a kind of continuous field, and the, the divisions are more or less arbitrary. Here, you have the different species groups separated out as uh, islands that are not touching or, or interacting. And then these are the two interesting ones, where they have individual definitions, but they're either touching or or bleeding into one another in, in, in these uh, in, in instances. Uh, we wanted to do something similar. Uh, these are actually, this was given to me by a colleague much later. This was one of our earliest sketches. Again, the notion of just a series of stones thrown together to create the museum. Uh, this phrase, which uh, came up in an interview with, with Luis Bencio and, and, and uh, uh, Emilio Tunion, non-centralized expansive systems capable of becoming specific at each point. Um, a grid is a non-centralized expansive system, but a grid is the same at any given point. So again, that's a pretty good definition of field conditions, that you take a continuous expansive repetitive system, but you produce difference locally uh, within that overall uh, coherent uh, system. So that was the kind of logic of aggregation of the project. Um, that We started with a very simple unit. I'll, I'll explain a little bit. It, it has a, uh, a, a pentagonal plan. Um, high degrees of variations in the unit, but there's a logic to the way they connect. So you go from, from the one to the many uh, in the project. So photograph of the model in context. So you see the way in which the internal measure of the project without replicating picks up the rhythm of the historic city, yet at the same time it clearly stands out as something different, something new, uh, that uh, the individual units form a whole that is, is, is greater than the parts. Now one of the interesting things about the Pentagon is that when you start combining pentagons, they don't pack closely, so it opens up courtyards that allow light down, and again in the notion of sort of provisionality uh, an openness that we, we wanted just to more or less fill the site and leave the perimeter kind of porous uh, that, and allow uh, the public spaces that were created not to have these, let's say, sort of sharp contextual definitions, uh, but to take on, again, more the character of the, uh, uh, the medieval city, uh, but with clearly uh, very new and very different uh, geometry. So this is the project in context on the waterfront. You see the way it's been lifted up, uh, and you see the profile, and there's uh, an echo of those iconic roofs, but not a literal uh, echo here. Uh, detailed study model, uh, you see the individual units. Um, the public spaces are down below, and uh, two floors of galleries with double height spaces uh, at times. Um, and we take the structure from these units. Ev there are 15 units. They're all identical in plan, pentagons. Pentagon's a very interesting figure. Um, pentagon is uh, triangles are stable, squares are stable. Pentagon is the simplest figure that has a kind of unstable dynamic quality because of the addition of that uh, fifth side. Um, we, we take the structure down to this single column that, that creates a kind of forest of columns at the ground floor and a kind of lattice work of structure that, again, um, the, the aggregation of parts disappears into this sense of a whole 
as a result of the, of the structural geometry. But then the columns coming down mark the location of the individual units. So here you see this large-scale detailed model where you can see the, the, the structure coming down, creating the sort of infrastructural quality of the public spaces that are horizontally uh, in continuity with the uh, city, and then the, the spaces of the gallery above that uh, have the definition of rooms or galleries relative to the re repetition of the module uh, itself. So here's the ground floor, and you can see the kind of interdigitated perimeter, uh, pulling people in um, and creating tight passages uh, and relationship to the water, uh, all of the, the kind of typical public spaces of the museum. Uh, here's the view coming up from the waterfront where you're, you're very aware of that structure, marking the location of the individual units, yet above they're wrapped with a continuous corrugated zinc rain screen to create that sense of unity. And then above, you have the, uh, uh, the galleries uh, for, um, that can be defined as, as separate spaces, but of course flow into one another. And through the double height, you have the, uh, the, the, the verticality and the very active profile of the roof here. Uh, this main level was for changing exhibitions of contemporary art. And then at the level above, where you really are under that very active profile, lower ceiling height, and uh, permanent collection of uh, paintings and photographs, still the ability to look, though, down to that other level. So here you see the kind of profile and the way that the, the, the uh, openings are made and the light is let in and the, the condition of the gallery below. And then again, uh, in context as uh, a very active part of the city uh, through, uh, by virtue of that lo the lower level having been lifted up and uh, minimally separated from uh, the city around it. Um, now, next project, uh, we, were, we, were, we were very interested in, 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 in working this, continuing to work in this way, um, but this was a uh, competition for an opera house in uh, Korea. And if there's a logical argument in the museum for that relationship, that calibration of the sort of part to whole relationship, the individual galleries and the larger collective identity of the museum, and keeping, in a sense, both of those visible and alive at the same time, the program of the Opera House is very, very singular and hierarchical. There's, there's probably nothing that's less field-like than opera somehow. So the, the, the challenge of working with this logic of aggregation with a, pro, with a program that has absolutely nothing to do with aggregation was one that inter, interested us uh, a, a great deal. Um, the site uh, is, there's a, a very uh, extensive uh, uh, landfill being proposed and a small artificial island, this little kidney-shaped thing. We had nothing to do with that form. Um, and you know, clearly, they had Sydney Opera House in mind. And the idea that this would be very iconic and identifiable, again, was very, very, very important to the, uh, uh, to the competition brief. Um, we came upon this uh, definition, uh, an erratic. An erratic is a rock that's in the wrong place. Um, and um, we, we thought of the project as a piece of the mountain that had been relocated between the city and the sea. Um, so working through the logic of that, that category of geological uh, form. And of course, some of the contradictions of, of opera today, uh, of course, you, you have the, 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 the grand tradition of excess and spectacle that belongs to opera. I mean, you know, I said there's nothing field-like about opera. Of course, Philip Glass and Robert Wilson actually made a very serial, uh, field-like kind of, kind of opera. So, uh, uh, you know, that, that, th th there are many, many things that are, that are uh, produced and composed today uh, that don't always refer back to the traditional uh, uh, notions of, of opera. Um, 
It's an inter interesting experiment. Google Opera House, click on images. Every image that comes up is Sydney Opera House. Um, this has become the defining icon of, of the Opera House. Uh, on the other hand, the, the, the Garnier Paris Opera as a kind of urban um, uh, artifact also continued to, to, to uh, interest us. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, 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 context, the, the cultural context of the project as well. Um, Busan is a, a lively, modern metropolis. Um, uh, and that's certainly part of the context that we're plugging into. But these are traditional Korean stone altars. And so again, if we, we could work through the language of the geological form somehow as a way of working through some of these uh, contradictions. So I, I suppose the three most iconic uh, opera houses are, are Sydney, uh, Garnier's o Paris Opera, and, and uh, Beirut. Um, which also to some extent was our starting point. We were, we were taken by this kind of shed-like form uh, here. And of course we realize that, that the little monopoly house is, is a pentagon, five sides. Um, so that became the building block for the project. And we started combining those. And then uh, as there, there's a kind of, kind of uh, kind of rotational logic here, and then that produces a larger piece uh, which could accommodate the, uh, the hall. And then uh, opera houses today are very complex. They need a lot of support. Uh, and then we also um, uh, wanted to activate some of the public's, public programs of the building. So uh, this is the plan structure of the project. Um, uh, it, it's made of these one, two, three, four, five, six identical modules plus one which is formally similar but scaled up. Um, but each of these modules then goes through a process of transformation that we take each of the vertices and they can be pushed up and down but because of the geometry of the uh, Pentagon all of those are triangular surfaces, triangulated surfaces, uh, no ruled surfaces, they're, they're, they're easy to build um, and easy to define geometrically. Then there's a trickier operation, which is that we took one of these um, pentagonal forms, we stack them on top of uh, one another, and we rotate them 90 degrees. And then again, by manipulating the vertices up and down, we're able to create space within the, the, the height of, of the building. So uh, if we were, we're working with this geological analogy we didn't, want, uh, we didn't want that form simply to be something that would be a kind of icon. We wanted to find a way to really inhabit that and to get people up onto and over the building at, at, at many different uh, levels. But the same logic, the same part to whole logic uh, that informed uh, the Marabor project is, is in operation here, where these simple forms combined one another to create a kind of complex sense of the whole. Uh, here's, you, here's the upper level pieces that create the upper level terraces, uh, and then a kind of plinth condition uh, that's necessary to accommodate some of the programmatic uh, um, uh, functions that, that, that were, were required. Um, so this is the basic organization of the project, and, and again, um, there's a stronger sense here of this forming into some sort of <clears throat> notion of the whole, but there are still moments here, for example, where it is possible to sort of break it down into its component uh, pieces. So the, the um, large hall is here. Mostly this is support space back here, public functions banquet hall, and then there are these two public terraces uh, within uh, the height of the building. I'm not going to go through all of this, um, but again, part of, the, part of the difference here is uh, if there's a certain similarity in the repetition of the parts with the galleries, uh, there's a very, very highly specific uh, set of programmatic requirements, many of, of which have very, very specific uh, requirements. Uh, I won't go through all of the plans. This is the most important one, the primary uh, public level and the auditorium level, 
with the conventional arrangements of stage and, and wings and backstage, the rehearsal rooms that kind of feed that, and then the public space, which is developed on this end, uh, the foyer uh, with the views back to the city, um, and then the two terrace levels, uh, including outdoor performance and uh, amphitheater spaces here, the view back uh, over the city uh, from here, and then the bridge level, uh, which contains restaurants and uh, other, other functions. Now, um, in, in that spirit of kind of experimentation and continuing to work uh, through this, this idea, um, we uh, got a chance to build one module of the Marabor project. Um, this is a house that I finished uh, about 10 years ago, and the clients have recently come back to me um, to uh, do a major addition to the house. Uh, the client is a very successful artist, and she's spending more time up there, and she wants a, a working studio uh, in, in the country. So everything from here over exists, built around uh, 1999. Everything from here over will be new. Uh, and clearly, we're, we're, we're working a kind of vertical piece against the horizontality of the, of the older house. So the, the horizontality that belonged to the landscape thinking is now countered with this vertical iconic thinking and uh, this kind of bridge condition between the two houses. There you can see a couple of Maryland's paintings there on the right. Um, but again, the, the the footprint is a pentagon for the new addition. This is the studio. That's the existing house. Extensive landscape work associated with this because of the level change. And the, the, the use of the pentagon here served two purposes. Uh, as I said before, it, by adding that fifth side to the pentagon, you destabilize the, uh, the, the square. And in particular, um, the, the client works with projection and it, by rotating that wall out, we got her long wall for projection and, uh, and, 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 and painting. So um, the project's being built very slowly and meticulously by, uh, carpenter, by a carpenter who started off life as a cabinet maker. Um, but uh, it's getting closer. Uh, you can see the, the, the level change over the site and the horizontality of this piece, and the very strong verticality of this piece here. But then when you come up here, it has a more domestic scale relative to the, to the existing. Um, and uh, this is that, that vertical piece of the studio uh, in its more or less uh, current state. Um, but I think the, 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 the point of this project, really, showing this project in this context, um, in, in a sense, coming full circle with a, with a single family house project that I showed uh, first, but also to suggest that if this kind of contradiction between the landscape works on the one hand and the built projects on the other, uh, I think through these experiments with aggregation and uh, the kind of combinatory language of the Marabor project and uh, the kind of renewed interest in verticality and the kind of iconicity of the house on the landscape uh, begins through the logic of the landform building and geological form to start uh, tying those two pieces back together again. So, thank you. Mm. Sounds live. Um, no, thank you, Stan, very much. Can I open the floor up to questions? Turn it over to you for a minute. Somebody's got to ask a question. Please don't be shy. And don't make me ask AA the AA audience is generally not shy. Yeah. No, I, well, I'll, I'll start with a, a quick question, which is a, a word that that didn't, uh, a term that didn't come up, but that, but that um, 
the shift to the interest in, in form especially is putting back on the table, which is of course, you know, we could describe the relationship between figure and ground. Figure, and in fact the figure is the word that I kept sort of thinking through. In a way sure. you're, you're making a case and more than just an appeal for a, a redemption of the figure as a term by which to rethink the landscape itself, let's say in some way. Um, and I suppose one, one question that comes out of that would be it, in a shift in interest to the actual projects themselves, are there, are there issues of techniques, representational or otherwise, which registers that shift? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think the, for, for me the, um, the key term is, still has to do with diagrammatics and, mm -hmm. and um, uh, the, uh, although you, you could argue that the diagram was not going to lead you to the figure, that, that there's yeah. something, something, something very, very abstract about, about the diagram. But, but I think by being very conscious, and I think you're, I think you're obviously right, both, there's, there's both a figurative quality to the plan making language and then, and then the, the, the return of the kind of verti verticality of the, of, of the figure. But, but I think it, it, it has to do, for me, um, with the figure as the resultant of a process and not the origin of that process. Uh, in other words, you don't start with the figure, find a way to make it, but the figure is something that emerges out of the, out of the procedures of combination. The other, the other um, feature of these projects that comes out quite strongly is the role of program in sure. arriving at the figure. Sure. I, and the program can be given form and or figure right. that can drive a project. Right, right. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I think this is, well, uh, I, I mentioned in a kind of aside that one of the great attractions of the, the landscape experience is this idea that in a, in a kind of open field, anything can happen. That, that land, I think one of the reasons why architects were so attracted to landscape was this notion that uh, you, you, could use, you could use topographical surfaces to link one program to another very, very smoothly. And there was a kind of fundamental open-ended quality to program in, in, in landscape. Um, that also could, could be a trap, though. And well, it, you, you know, um, one of the lessons we learn from ecologies, right, is that systems don't self-organize unless the initial conditions are, are specified with a very high degree of precision. So I think I still, that, that's certainly one area where uh, I, I still work according to that kind of logic, but I think now the the, the, the tools are architectural tools as opposed to land, landscape tools. That, that is to say, the, the idea that somehow the job of the architect is to set those initial conditions with a high degree of precision, whether that means uh, you know, specifying things very, very precisely in terms of room sizes and walls and partitions, or it means um, working with the kind of systems of, of, of connection. But those, those, I think the point, and, and to, to speak to the way the question was asked, those are formal and organizational decisions that have programmatic consequences. Oh. Um, so I, I think the, the notion that somehow form and program are at odds is yeah. one that, that I, I, um, I, I think we just have to kind of reject out of, out of hand. That, uh, but. Uh, but it's, it's more the programmatic consequences of formal choices than the idea that is driven by, by program in the first instance. So. Or, that, or that you can sort of, you know, simply, you can script program just by saying, you know, X is going to happen in Y space. Uh, X will only happen in Y space if the configurations of that space are such that it will trigger, trigger those. And, and, and after all, I mean, success for an architect is not that the program you expected is happening in that space, but that something different is happening in that space. I mean, that, you know, uh, you, you, always want, you always want the performance of the building to be in excess of, of what you've designed into it. Yeah? Now that, uh, um, I wanted to ask that a lot of your buildings seem to be icons, and uh, 
um, how does iconographic architecture relate with the field conditions to you? Well, the, the short answer is it, it doesn't quite. And that's, that's really the kind of contradiction that I'm kind of teasing out of these, these, these last projects. And also, I would say it, it is retrospectively a, a critique of the field conditions idea. Uh, I mean, the field conditions idea was very closely associated with the mat building. And the mat building, as we all know, is our, were, mat buildings were buildings that, that this specifically held the uh, iconicity of building at, at arm's length. So, so I, I think in, in a kind of larger sense, I think there are two issues here. Um, on, on the one hand, I'm, I'm sympathetic and you know, have been sort of having this ongoing conversation with Alejandro Zarapolo, who's been teaching at Princeton for the past three years. Um, and he's been doing this research on the building envelope. And that, to me, is very interesting because, of course, it, it could be seen as a kind of auto-critique as well, that you know, this is the architect of Yokohama, the, 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 the prototypical uh, uh, artificial landscape with no vertical surfaces. Right, um, saying no, no. As architects, actually, we've got to rethink the vertical surface. Right. So, so um, now, uh, I think in Alejandro's case, there's 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 two reasons for that rethinking of the of the vertical surface. Uh, the one is political, which is to say that that the 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 claim of Yokohama and buildings like Yokohama is that we live in a world in which everything is connected. Connectivity is good. And therefore, uh, an architecture that promotes connectivity is a, is a, is a, is a better architecture. And uh, I, I think, like many others, Alejandro sort of looked around and said, well, actually, that project of utopian connectivity didn't really get us that far. And uh, that, that uh, if, in fact, if you look at political issues around the world, they're all, they're all being played out around borders and boundaries. So if, in, in other words, if architects ignore the problem of the border and the boundary and the limit, something that's fundamental to architecture as a discipline, they're giving up one of their, their most important uh, instrument, political instruments, right? The second side of that, I, I think, is uh, that, um, that um, you're, there, there, there's just, at the end of the day, there's simply a really limited number of programs that can be solved with the language of interconnected horizontal surfaces. I mean, you know, there was a period back in the 90s at Columbia when we were all giving parking garages for, uh, for, for assignments. So, so um, I, I, I think at a, at a certain point, there's a kind of recognition that we can come back to the vertical surface to the building envelope, to the building as icon. But we're not, we're not going back to the sort of old semiotic notions of the 70s and the 80s. But we're now looking at the building envelope and the building icon with the benefit of the experience of this sort of design research of the, of the uh, 90s and the early 2000s um, that says that's, that's one of many potential tools that, that, that we, we need to work with today. That's a long answer, I know, but I think I got to your question. Other questions? Anyone? Then we're going to stop there. Stan, thank you so much. That OK, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Just to remind you, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, the book is around the corner. It should be right in there. Am I right? Somebody? Sign copy. It should be right around the corner there. And thanks so much. That's great. Okay.